Imam Siraj Wahad is the Imam of Masjid Taqwa in Brooklyn, New York. And he is well known among Muslims in uh, North America as a dynamic speaker and supporter of Islamic causes. Imam Siraj accepted Islam in 1969 and he received Imam training at Umul Qura University in Mecca in uh, 1978. And he has, on, uh, he has gone on to become a national and international speaker on Islam. He has been the Vice President of Isna U.S. since 1997 and has served on Majlis Ashura since 87. And he has also appeared on several national TV shows and interviews, especially about the anti-drug campaigns that um, he has received high praises for from the media and the NYPD uh, for initiating anti-drug patrol in Brooklyn, New York since uh, 90, 1988. Um, I ask now Brother Omar Dusuki to come forward and recite some ayah from the Quran, inshallah. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل يا عبادي الذين أسرفوا على أنفسهم لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا وأنيبوا إلى ربكم وأسلمونه من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب ثم لا تنصرون واتبعوا أحسن ما أنزل إليكم ربكم واتبعوا أحسن ما أنزل إليكم من ربكم من قبل أن يأتيكم العذاب بغتة وأنتم لا تشعرون تقول نفس يا حسرة على ما فرطت في جنب الله وإن كنت لمن الساخرين أو تقول لو أن الله هداني لكنت من المتقين أو تقول حين ترى العذاب أو تقول حين ترى العذاب لو أن لي كرة فأكون من المحسنين Say, O oh my Ibadi, my slaves, who have transgressed against themselves by committing evil deeds and sins, despair not of the mercy of Allah. Verily, Allah forgives all sins. Truly, He is all forgiving, most merciful. And turn in repentance and in obedience with true faith, Islamic monotheism, to your Lord and submit to Him in Islam before the torment or the punishment comes upon you, and then you will not be helped. And follow, not, and follow the best of that which is sent down to you from your Lord, i.e. this Qur'an, do what it orders you to do and keep away from what it forbids before the punishment and the torment comes on you suddenly while you perceive not. Lest a person should say, Alas, my grief that I was undutiful to Allah. I have not done what Allah has ordered me to do. And I was indeed amongst those who mocked at the truth, mocked at the, the right to be worshipped uh, to Allah, Islam and the Qur'an and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all the faithful believers. Or lest he should say, if only Allah had guided me, I should have, have indeed have been among the muttaqun, the pious and the righteous. Or lest he should say that when he sees the torment and the punishment, if only I had another chance to return to this world, then I should indeed be among the muhsinun or the good doers. Assalamu alaikum. You look good. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah. 
wa shahadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'du Brothers and sisters, the students of George Mason University, especially the MSA, I am very humbled by your invitation of me to come tonight to speak to you on a, for a few moments in what I believe to be a really critical discussion, not, not just for Muslims on campus, not just Muslims in America, not just Muslims around the world, but for every American, indeed every human being, we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we get back on track? Indeed, many of you who sit here may think you're on track. And you don't really need this lecture. I believe all of us are off track. Beginning with the Imams, the heads of nations, parents, teachers, I believe all of us are off track. My objective tonight is to get you to see five things. If I do these five things, I'm going to be happy. And you're going to have to help me because each of these five things are going to take about an hour and a half. Nobody's laughing. <laughs> Number one, if we leave here and I have adequately given you, number one, the nature of God. The nature of God or, if you like, the attributes of Allah. Lahu al-asma'u al-husna. He has the most beautiful names. We cannot have this topic tonight going back until you understand about the Creator. So number one, I want you to know about the Creator. Number two, tonight I will talk about the nature of man. Not the nature of Muslims, but the nature of man. Number two, and 2A, I want to talk something about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam under the title, The Nature of Man. Number three, I, I, I put that as a separate category so you could make it you can make it one, two, three, if you like, or one, two, two, and two A, if you like. But let's call it three. Let's keep it a separate category. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. I want to tell you why I want to talk about him in, in terms of this topic. So number three, I want to talk about the nature of sin. The nature of sin, number four. And number five, I want to talk about how to get back. And in the talk, these five points I'm going to be weaving back and forth in and out so that you get a good picture. And I want you to remind me if I forget, I want to give some nasiha, some advice to the American uh, justice system or criminal uh, system, I'm going to give some advice based upon what we will get from this talk. If you remind me, would you remind me? Inshallah, don't let me walk out without giving the, the advice to the American criminal justice system. Okay, would you do that? That's your responsibility. Now, number one, and I will debate any of you on the issue that I'm about to bring. My argument tonight is no one knows anything about Allah. God, no one knows anything about God except what he reveals about himself. Other than that, you're guessing and you're speculating. You can't think what you think you know God is unless he reveals himself. And who does he reveal himself to? He reveals himself to prophets. 
and messengers. According to our tradition, there have been 124,000 prophets called al anbiya prophets. And 315 messengers, Rasul, Rasul, in the plural, Rusul. I wish I had a board to write with, but you want to have to use your imagination. I can write on that? There's something I can write on? All right, that's okay. You know, I'll write here. You'll see it, inshallah. <laughs> so, every messenger, Rasul, is also a prophet. Nabi, the plural al anbiya But every anbiya every prophet is not a messenger. Messengers are higher levels. In these 315 messengers, they receive books. The Quran mentioned many of them. Many of them Allah doesn't mention in the Quran. The Bible mentions some of them. The Bible don't mention all of them. And of those 315 Rasul messengers, in the Quran, five of them are mentioned in a very special way. These are the highest level of prophets. Five of them are mentioned. I will mention them. Abraham, Noah, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Special of the 315, three, five of them are specially mentioned in the Quran in a very, very heavy level, higher than the others, and that is Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. If you want to know about God, you have to go to the Torah. Where does the Torah come from? The Torah comes from Allah. And God, Allah, revealed the Torah to the great prophet Moses. So Muslims must believe in the Torah. The Torah is not an inferior book. Allah mentioned Fiha Hudan Wanur. In the Torah is guidance and light. If you want to know about God, then you have to get it through Moses. Peace and blessing be upon him. Muslims believe in Moses. We believe in the angels. We believe in God's books, all of them. And we believe in all of God's prophets. So where did the Torah come from? It came from Allah. True? Where did the Gospel come from? The Gospel comes from Allah. And in the Gospel revealed to who? Jesus. Peace and blessing be upon him is guidance and light. So all of the revelation of all of the prophets we believe in. And if you want to know about God, you've got to read the scripture. And finally, the last revelation of the Quran. Hudan, Hudan wa nur. Guidance and light from the Quran. And if you want to know about God and the nature of God, you can't guess and you can't speculate. You gotta read the scripture. Now, I'm going to choose a few verses from the Quran to make my point about the nature of God. First of all, when you start dealing with Allah, it's difficult because he's, he's al-khaliq, he's the creator, we makhluk, we creation. And, and it's difficult to really appreciate him because Allah calls himself in the Quran, in the Torah, in the Gospel, he calls himself al-wahid. He's wahid, he's one, he's unique. 
There is nothing like him. And if you think you know, you don't know, except what Allah reveals, he reveals something about himself so that human beings can get some measure of understanding of who he is and who his nature is. But he has to reveal it, you can't guess it. And this is what prophets come with. Prophets come teaching the knowledge of God. Now let me give you one verse from the Quran and see if I can develop this a little bit. I'lamu, Allah says in the Quran, I'lamu, no. And Allah shadidu iqab. Stop. You better know, Allah is saying, you better know that God is strong and punishing. See, you can't, you can't look at Allah one-sided and the, what you say, good side, the merciful side, the forgiving side, only because Allah says, Ilamu, you better know, and Allah shadidu al-iqab. You better know that he's strong in punishing, in punishment on the one hand. But on the other hand, he's forgiven and merciful. And sometimes we are not sure whether we're going to see the punishment of God or his mercy. His mercy. He forgives whomever, whomever he pleases, and he punishes whomever he pleases. And no one can change him from his will. Either he's going to punish or he's going to forgive. But you better know that he has both of them. And that's going to be critical when we get into the, to the last portion about how to come back to him. Now, let me give you an example. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, says something incredible in one of the, one of the traditions. He said, If the believer knew the extent of Allah's punishment, none of them, not one, would anticipate, expect to go to paradise. By the way, this hadith, you want to check it? Rawayu Muslim. It's a Muslim hadith in the volume called at tawbah forgiveness. That if the believer understood the extent of God's anger, his punishment, not one of us would think, would anticipate, would expect to go to paradise. And I'm going to give you some examples. And then he ended by saying, and if the disbeliever knew the extent of Allah's mercy, every one of them would think that they would go to paradise. Huh? Yeah. You see? And the key for us is to, number one, understand him, know him, what makes him angry, and then also know what can get his forgiveness. That's what we want to do because we want to come back. Because my position tonight, you ready? Is my, you ready? Are you, are you ready? My position tonight, all of us are far gone. All of us. And that's why in the Bible says, it says in the Bible, there's not one righteous, no, not even one. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Because some of you sitting up here think you're okay. But you're not. I'm going to show you in a couple of minutes. All right. What are we talking about? We're talking about the nature of Allah because we have to understand if you want to make Tauba, you want to get back on track, you better know. You better know what the track is and you better know the one that you got to get back to. Two examples. How many of you have pets at home, raise your hand. You have a pet, man? You, you have a pet? Huh? You do or you don't? You're not sure? You had one this morning? Well, 
We got a cat. My wife called it, calls it pretty girl. What am I going to say? <laughs> and I want to talk two traditions. I want to talk about a cat and a dog. First, the cat, and I did it in this order for reason. According to our tradition, this tradition is called Mutafikun Alehi. It's in Bukhari Hadith and Muslim Hadith, one of the most authentic Hadith. Ujibat Imratin fi Hirra. A woman was punished in the hereafter, in hellfire, by God because of a cat that she had that she locked up in the house and she didn't feed it and she didn't give it water and nor did she let it go so it can get its own food and water and she locked the cat up until the cat died. And the prophet said, that Allah punished this woman in the hereafter, in the hellfire, because of a cat. This is, this is Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the supreme being, the creator of everything, is punishing his great creature, his great creature man, human beings, because of what they did to a cat. And you see these people who are making dogs fight and kill each other? Man, shoot, man. <laughs> what? Shoot, you crazy. What you talking about? Now, a dog. There are many versions of this hadith, this, this tradition. I give you one of them. A prostitute from Ben Israel, from the children of Israel, a prostitute, she was thirsty. And she went and she got some water. And after she got water, she saw a dog that was licking its tongue in the mud because it was thirsty trying to, get, trying to get water. And she said that this dog is suffering what I'm suffering from. So this prostitute, she went down in the well, and the hadith said she took her, her, her um, Her shoe, you thought I was searching for something heavy, right? Her shoe, and she put water in the shoe, put the shoe in her mouth, and climbed out of the well and gave water to a dog. And the prophet said, peace and blessing be upon him, that Allah looked upon that deed of the woman, and he was pleased, and he forgave her her sins. And one tradition said, he entered her into paradise. For giving water to a dog, go to paradise. Water to a dog, the God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is so merciful that a person give water to a dog and God forgive the sin of the person and put him in paradise because of the good kind of that they did to an animal. If they did it for an animal, think of the good that God would do if you give water to a human being. Right? So now look at you, you got them both. On the one hand, a cat punished in a hellfire because you didn't let the cat go, and a dog, you go to paradise because you gave it good treatment. And the only one, the only one who can put you in paradise, the only one is Allah. And the only one that can assign you to hellfire, the only one is Allah, God the Almighty. So we are beginning now to see that there are two sides of Allah. Now, let me give you this quickie, and then we go on. One morning, I was in the masjid. I was going to the masjid. I parked my car. And I'm sitting there gathering my books together early in the morning, maybe 8 o'clock, 7, 7.45 in the morning. It was in the summertime. Uh, uh, the summer, no, it was in, um, it was in the, it was, it was like fall, but the weather was nice. And the, my window was open. And I'm looking, there were about three or four children, age six, seven, eight, and they were going to school, and there was a man accompanying them. And then there was a little girl, she was lagging behind. Maybe she's eight years old. She's lagging behind. And he says, come on, come on, let's go, come on, let's go. And I want to tell you what that little girl said. 
And I want you to think about it. She said, leave me alone. Leave me alone. You are not my father. Leave me alone. You are not my father. That's, that's heavy. Isn't that heavy? Right, so I need somebody to help me. What, what's the implication here? What was she saying? Because she's saying something really deep. She's going to help me in my lecture tonight. What was she saying? What's the implication of what she's saying? Somebody help me. Yes. That, that, um, that's not her father. That's right. That's not her father. You got it. What's the implication? You going to try again? Go ahead. Don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do. He got it. Tell me another implication. What's the, because she's, she's at the root, what she said is at the root of what we're going to talk about. Yes. She's saying he has no right to Ha! If he don't have right, who have rights? A father. Why? Why does a, why, why, why does her father have a right to tell her what to do? You don't have to read it in a book. You don't have to read it in the Quran. You don't have to read it in the Torah. You don't have to read it in the Gospel. Inherently, every baby born by nature knows that the mother and father have two rights over it. Number one, the mother and father have the right to tell her what to do. Oh, you don't like what I'm saying. See, things change now. You, you can't tell me what to do. I hear it, man. I hear it. Little kids looking at them. You, are, you, can't, you can't tell me what to do. I'll call cops on you. And they will. And, and they will. But by nature, every child knows that, A, my parent have a right to tell me what to do. And you know what? Every parent knows that. Right? Right? I have women, they walk down the street of Brooklyn, not in, not in Northern Virginia. But they're walking down the street in Brooklyn, and they tell the child, you better come over here, I'll break your arm. Take it out the socket and put it back in. <laughs> what? <laughs> but she knows she has the right, A, to tell her what to do, and two, and two, and number two, to punish. A parent has an inherent right to punish the child as long as they don't go beyond the boundaries and it becomes child abuse. But every parent has a right to, to, to discipline the child. Watch this. Spare the rod. Spoil the child. Who said that? Spare the rod and spoil the child. In old days, man, we boom, spank him. No, I'm serious. You don't do that no more. And that's why you have the problems. <laughs> I'm serious. The prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, teach your children to make prayer at the age of seven. And if they don't, if you don't get the message in your mind, you get it in your, you said it. <laughs> now, if, if a parent have a right to discipline the children, if a parent have an inherent right, and what gives them the right? By birth. Mother gave birth to the child. And that's why, by the way, if you study Islam, when someone asks the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, are you amali ahabu illallah? What deed is most loved by Allah? He said, as-salat al-waqtiha, pray on time. Thumma, thumma man, thumma. He said, biru walidain, Bir, biru walidain, obedience to parents. So in Islam, in Islam, we respect our parents. My mother's still alive. And I still say, yes, ma'am. I don't argue with my mother, whatever she say, yes, mom. Whatever my mother said, whatever my mother said, I would never talk back to my mother, never. I would let my mother spank me if she wanted to. If she can catch me. <laughs> I'm pretty fast. But you know, we have respect for our parents. Now, number one, number two, I don't know any nation on this earth that doesn't have law. 
you know what I mean? Laws to govern it. Should we have a society without laws? Should we? Should we? You don't know? You look like you're hesitating. I don't know, maybe we should have law. Every nation on this earth have law, but the, but the law of man is tricky. Let me tell you why the law of man is tricky. Three things, number one, laws differ from country to country. Let me give you one example. Do you know in communist China, if you're caught distributing pornography, you don't know what pornography is? Close your ears. <laughs> you don't know what pornography is, right? Your son, your son know what? He doesn't know. Okay, good. <laughs> you know, if you're caught selling pornography in communist China, you know what the punishment is? Death. Immediate death. Laws differ from country to country. The country in Nepal. If you commit adultery, you know what the punishment is? Let me show you. I'm trying to demonstrate to you. The people who commit adultery, the man and the woman, they're put in a chair, and the chair is tied, sturdy on a, on a, a, a board. And then they are placed over a pool of water. And they're slowly dipped in the water until the heads go under the water. And you can hear them grasping for air. And they pull them out. And they dip them again. And they pull them out before they drown. And they dip them again, and they keep on doing that until they drown to death. Laws differ from country to country. In some countries, if you commit incest, they will bury you alive. Some countries, they will burn you alive. And if you study, and I study these things, and I will tell you all the laws, how they differ from country to country. Number one. Number two, laws differ from state to state. Now, I ask you a question. Are you permitted? Yeah, you. See, the rule is whoever sits in front of me when I give a talk, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> so now you know. See, that's why they're sitting back there. They already know. Are you permitted to marry your cousin? No. No. In? In? Aha. Uh -huh. Ha. What you say? Safe. Same thing, yeah. Safe, right? It all depends on what state you live in. Some states in the United States of America, you can marry your first cousin. Some states you can't, because the law differs from state to state. Now, you all know what fornication is? I'm really sorry. I know this sounds X-rated. It's like an X-rated talk, right? I got to keep thinking about my young brother here. I'm so, I'm so sorry. Dad, will explain it to you later, right? <laughs> Do you know that fornication to unmarried couples, to unmarried people, in some states like Michigan, you know what the penalty is? $5,000 fine and five years in prison. It's on the books. But in the state of Arkansas, the punishment for adultery, adultery, fornication, adultery, the punishment in Arkansas, $20 fine. <laughs> you get my point? State to state. Number three, laws differ, differ from time to time. So the laws change. The laws in America from the days of the old colonial is different. They have strong laws uh, that protected the family. And those laws have changed. And by the way, just to you know, be honest with you, 
is that even though these laws exist on, on, on the on books, they're seldom enforced. So I said Michigan, but they don't enforce it. Okay? So what am I saying? What point am I making? If the country has the right, if the legislative, if the judicial have a right, if the executive have a right to carry out the law, and if the uh, legislative have the right to make the law and the judicial to judge the law, and they punish you, you punished in this country, in any country, if you violate the law of that country, right? If in some, in some instances there's death penalty, and these penalties are the creation of man, if man has a right to create law and punish, if parents have the right to order the children and to punish them if they disobey, then you tell me how come Allah, God, the creator of all of us, he don't have the right to punish us. He has the right to punish us. Am I right? And you know what? Really, brothers and sisters, that's why Allah says in Quran, يَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَا وَيُعَذِّبُ مَنْ يَشَا وَاللَّهُ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ قَدِيرٌ Allah has power over all things. Now, so number one, we got that out the way, <coughs> the nature of God. Number two, the nature of man. This will take a few minutes. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you something about yourself. Don't worry, I'm in the same category. We are all sinners. We are. All of us. Every one of us who stand and who sit here, mothers and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers and teachers and presidents and, and judges and all of us are sinners. A couple of them, a couple of things I want to take from tradition. Let me give you one which I think is the most remarkable. I taught this tradition I'm about to give you and one of my students said, Imam Siraj, that is very dangerous. What you said is very dangerous. And I'm going to say it, I'm going to say it to you. But the Prophet said, peace and blessing be upon him. Listen to it. It is a very deep statement. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Lawlam Lawlam and he began the statement by saying, I swear by him in whose hand my life is. If you, human beings, had not committed any sin, Allah would have destroyed all of you and brought people who would commit sin so that they can ask Allah's forgiveness so that Allah would forgive them. This is authentic hadith, mutafakun alayh, Bukhari and Muslim. لَا لَمْ تُذْنِبُونَ ذَحْبُ لَهُ بِكُمْ وَجَعَدِ قَوْمٍ يُذْنِبُونَ فَيَسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى فَيَغْفِرُ لَهُمْ What does this tradition mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? I just said it. Be honest. What does it mean to you? Now I'll raise my hand because I want you to raise your hand. <laughs> What does it mean to you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, that's true. But there's something more here. Yes. Yeah, 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 yes, but something else. Why would God destroy us and bring someone who would commit sin? Yes. I guess it's trying to show that it's impossible. That it yes. It is impossible to be a human being and not sin. Does Allah want us to sin? No. Who said yes? No. He don't want us to sin, but he understands the nature. Let me say a few things and you'll see where I'm coming from. See if you remember the statement. To err is human and 
Very good. And to forgive is divine. To err is human. One of the statements that Prophet Muhammad made, peace and blessing be upon him, he made it often, and I often make it, is, is eloquent. He said, Inna ma'ana bashar. I am only a human being. Inna ma'ana bashar. I am only a human being. What is the fifth leading cause of death in this country? Smoking. Huh? Smoking. smoking? Pretty good. It's not bad. No, it's not smoking. The fifth leading cause of death in America is accidents. It's accidents. Why? Because you're a human being. How many basketball players do we have here? When you make a mistake, sister raise her hand. <laughs> when you make a mistake in basketball, what do they call it? Trap turnover. Ha! Good. It's a turnover. You make a mistake in football, it's a fumble, interception. Tennis. I don't know. Tennis? Fault. Every sport must have a way to somehow notate mistakes and errors. N no one is perfect, never. You, if you shoot foul, show, foul shots, you're going to miss. Eventually, you're going to miss because you're a human being. If you throw the ball, you're, gonna, you, you're not going to catch it all the time. You're not, you, go, you know, right? You got my point, right? Because you're human beings. And then the prophet said, Every human being is a sinner. Every human being is a sinner. Every human being? Every? 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 Yes? Every human being? Every? Every human every every human being? Every human being? Every human being. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, said that God said, Yeah, Ibadi, Kunukun Dolun, in the men had to fast duni ahdikum, all my servants. Every one of you are misguided unless I guide you. Therefore, ask me and I will guide you. Every one of you are misguided. Every one of you are misguided unless I, God, Allah, guide you. Therefore, you ask me and I will guide you. What do you think you say every day, 17 times a day, every day at least, Ihdina surat al mustaqim. Ihdina surat al mustaqim. Ihdina surat. Guide me to the straight path. Guide me to the straight path. Every prayer, every rakah, guide me to the straight path. You know why? Because if Allah don't guide us, we're misguided. Now, here's a tough one. Anybody ever give you a check? Anybody ever give you a blank check? I got a blank check twice in my life. Allahu Akbar. I love it. What if somebody gave you a blank check, Allah, and said to you, no matter what you do, you will, it will never be held against you. You'll go to paradise. No problem, no accounting at all. You understand what I'm saying? No matter what you do, do whatever you want to do. No punishment in this life and no punishment in the hereafter. How many would like that? You don't like that? You don't like this? You don't like it? Hmm? No? You think it's a trick question, right? Man, tell me, no matter what I do, I'm straight, I'm going to paradise? Shoot. <laughs> Talking about, man. What would you do with it? What would you do? What would you do? 
Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was given a blank check. And there's many hadith that proves it. One day the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was praying so long until his feet began to swell. And his wife Aisha, she's looking at him and she said, Why are you doing that? Why are you doing Allah has already forgiven you your past sins and your future sins. This all throughout tradition. We know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, be upon him he has the special thing that no matter what he does, Allah is going to forgive him. Now, th th this hadith shows us that despite that, he's still the most righteous and the most pious. Despite Allah giving him that gift, and I said, why are you making all this extra prayer, right? Because the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, is special. Now, this is a tough part. Now, we're almost finished. By the way, I'm coming to my conclusion. Right? I've got a couple more to go, right? We did the nature of God, uh, nature of man a little bit, and now something about Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. I'm going to talk about the nature of sin, and then we're going to talk about how to get back. I'll be finished. I'll be surprised if if two hours is, and I'm still talking. <laughs> I'll be surprised. I'm saying I'll be surprised. <laughs> this is tough. Jews, Muslims, uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims agree with this point. If you ask a Jew, a Christian, or a Muslim, who was the first man? They would say, Adam. Same name. Adam in Torah, Adam in Injil, Gospel, and Adam in Quran. First man, Adam. We believe that. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but I'll just leave it for you to consider. Moses and Allah has a way of bringing people from different time zones together. So Allah brought Moses and Adam, and they had a debate. And Moses, peace and blessing be upon him. I know, I know it's strange. I know, I know, I know, I know it's strange. But 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 Allah has the power in to, to bring people who've died together to have conversation. We'll talk about that another time. That's what I'm saying. I just just kind of leave it for you. This is by the way, you find it in Bukhari Hadith, volume number eight, under the section called the Qadr, the pre uh, 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 pre uh, pre measurement. Um, Anyway, Moses was, and by the way, by the way, if you study, you'll find that one of the wisest men ever was Musa, Moses. And if you, if you study the hadith volume number four in Bukhari hadith, under the section Al-Anbiya, the prophets, it talks about Moses and how wise he was, the smartest human being on the earth. And we, this is another conversation. But Moses was condemning Adam. He said, you know, God created you, put you in a, in a garden, and you, you, uh, uh, you, know, you disappointed us. And then, and, then, and then Adam said, how can you blame me for something that was written for me before I was created? And then the remarkable thing the prophet said, peace and blessing be upon him, Adam defeated Moses in that argument. It's another issue, but this is just nice for you to think about. You can go, that's your homework assignment. And next time you invite me back, give me the answer. <laughs> you will invite me back again. Inshallah. Now here's a, here's a toughie. Let's set the stage first. How many of you want to go to paradise? Raise your hand. OK, great. OK. Let me set the stage. Yeah, Adam. Uskun. Anta wa zawjuka al-jannah. وَقُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَةً حَيْتُ شِتُّ مَا وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ this, this is great, this is great stuff, man. This is great stuff. Here, Adam and his wife, I want you to imagine, they're in paradise. Can you see it? In everything in paradise, Allah says, you can have anything you want. Anything. One exception. 
Just don't go near that tree. That's it. You know how big Jenna is? It's bigger than this auditorium. <laughs> right? It's bigger than Je pa pa you in paradise, man. The place where you want to go, you're there. Both feet are in. And all you got to do is avoid one tree. God, man. One tree. How many of you, and I want an honest answer, think you would not have eaten from the tree? Raise your hand. Good. Very good. Raise your hand. You change your mind? You put it, put it right back down. Raise them up high. Raise them up high. High. Good. How many of you say, yeah, I probably would have eaten from the tree, yeah? Why do you, why do you say yes? It's just too tempting. I mean, like, when people throw things in your face, I mean, honestly, honestly. I love it. Yes. When somebody puts something in your face, yes. you can't have that one thing, it's like, why? Yes. Why can't I have that? I mean, yeah. <laughs> but, but God is telling you don't do it. Makes a difference? It does? It does? It makes a difference? Yes? Huh? It's still human. Well, let me tell you something. I agree with you. From the very beginning, we see the nature of man. Rebellious. Let me give you a few pointers and then we almost finish. Think about this. You know how many people on this earth? About six billion. And every day on this earth, intimacy between men and women happen 100 million times, uh, 100, 100 million times a day. This is not my figures, this is according, according to who? According to who? Who? World Health Organization. <laughs> according to who? Now, well, who's on first? No, no. That's a different talk. According to the World Health Association, 100 million times a day, intimacy between men and women. Now, between you and I, is rumored that most of that takes place in New York City. <laughs> but that's another issue. 100 million times a day that results in 910,000 conceptions a day. That results in 350,000 sexually transmitted diseases a day. That results in 150,000 abortions a day. 150,000 abortions a day. 350,000 sexually transmitted diseases a day. 910,000 conceptions every day on this earth. Now, sisters, I want you to excuse me for one minute. Stay here, I'm gonna to talk to the brothers, right? <laughs> but don't go nowhere, yeah. right? Brothers, I wanna to talk to you for a second. And don't worry, the, the women, they can't hear us, <laughs> okay? And I want an honest answer. First, how many brothers are married? Okay, good, good. All right, this is the question. How many of the men here love and are attracted to women? Raise your hand. Yeah, right. All right. You're not sure? <laughs> Any brother who didn't raise a hand, see me later, we gotta talk. <laughs> All right? We talk later. <laughs> what I am saying, what I am saying is it is absolutely natural for men and women to be attracted to one another. It is absolutely natural. Allah created you like that. But if you want to be successful, you have to do according to what he commands. Adam 
and his wife, by the way, Allah mentions in the Quran, if you study the Quran, it's beautiful, they both ate from the tree. Allah gave both of them the instructions. Let taqarabaz, the duel. Ya Adam, uskun, anta wa zawjuka jannah wa kula. You two eat. You two. Let taqarabaz. You two don't go near the tree. Or you two become, you know, among the wrongdoers. Now, the bottom line, brothers and sisters, number four, is the nature of sin. If God tell man and woman what not to do, there's a price that you have to pay if you do it. In the Bible, they say something like this, the wages of sin uh, uh, is death. Is it, am I right? The wages of sin are death, right? There is a price that you have to pay every time you commit a sin. What is a sin? What's a sin? Let's do this for a second. Let's not call it a sin. Let's call it something different. And sometimes what Allah's messenger, what they do, is they make us understand something on the human level in order to understand the divine level. Let's not call it sin. Let's call it crime. Okay? Let's not call it sin. Call it crime. Now, I need you to help me. Most populated nation on the earth? China. Population of China? 1,300,000,000. Million. Second most populated nation on the earth? Yeah. India. Population? 1 billion? 84 million, something like that. By the way, soon India is going to surpass China as the most populated nation on earth. <laughs> Number three, third most populated nation on earth. Indonesia? No, not Indonesia. Hmm? United States of America. United States of America is the third most populated nation on earth with a population of 300 million. What's the population of China? What did I say? One billion, three hundred million. So China has how many more people than America? One whole billion more. Yet, Americans have 500,000 more prisoners than all of China. <laughs> Just think about it. If all of the people who are under the supervision of the criminal justice system in America, if they were a state of the United States of America, they would be the 16th most populated nation in America, uh, uh, 16th most populated state in America. You with me so far? Now let me read this to you, it's gonna blow your mind. These are not my figures. These are the figures from the FBI. And it, what you do, see that book there, brother? Show them the, hand, hand, uh, this show the book. This is called the World Almanac. I ad, ad, um, advise all leaders to pick this up every year. And these give you the actual facts. This tell you what's going on in America and what's going on around the world. You don't have to guess. These are the actual facts. It's the World Almanac, comes out every year. And I get them, three companies put them out, put, put them out, I get all of them and I compare them. This is what I do. This is, this is my, I'm a researcher. I'm not a, um, I'm not a speaker. <laughs> no, really, I'm very, very shy. <laughs> I am. Now, this is put out by the, uh, these are the latest figures put out by the FBI. It's the number of victimizations. That means people victim of, victim of crimes. All of them together, are you ready, in the United States, 23,440,720 victims of crime. Violent crime, 5,173,720. Property crime, 18,039,930. Theft, theft, 
The prisons are filled up with you. Man is a sinner. Man is a criminal. And you want me to be honest with you? Do you know the difference between many of us on the outside and those on the inside of prison? You know, you know one of the major differences? They got caught. Think about all the things that we do. You don't have to look around the world. You don't have to look at no one else. Just look at yourself tonight. And look, and look what you do. You say, well, it makes a difference. God said don't do it, but yet God is telling us every day what not to do, and we're still doing the opposite. Um, Adam, you want to talk about Adam. How could Adam do that? <laughs> There you go. There you go, boy. Don't give me a mic, man. Be here all night. Allah gave Adam instruction, no problem. But how many instructions does he give us? Ask a couple questions. How many in here are Muslims? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Ask you a couple questions. This is my own, I did some research. It's not scientific, it's a little study. Um, according to Cornell University, they did a, they did a study in 19, uh, 2002, and they said that there are 8 million Muslims in America. That's what they say. And they said at the present rate of expansion or growth of Muslims in America, they said Cornell University by 2014, there will be 16 million Muslims in America. Let me ask you this question. See if you agree with my finding. Do you think that there are more Muslims who go to the masjid or Muslims who don't go to the masjid? Who say don't go? Who say go? I agree with you. I agree with you. Do you think more Muslim children go to full-time Muslim school or public school? Public school. Let's see if we can play with some figures. According to the New York City Police Department, they just put out a study about Muslims in New York City. They said there are between 600,000 and 750,000 Muslims in New York City. I think there are more than that. But let's take their figure. Let's take the high figure. Let's take 750,000. How many masters do you think in New York City? There are 200 masters in New York City. Let's assume that each masjid has 1,000 people going to the masjid. How many people is that? Just mathematics, man. 200,000, right? 200,000 going to the masjid, and you know each masjid don't have 1,000. Right? It's less. On average, it's less. We are Muslims. If, you know how many Muslim schools we have in New York City? Muslim full-time schools, 35. Let's say each one has 1,000 students. How many students is that? 35,000. Where are the Muslim children? Over 95% of Muslim children in America go to public school. Less than 5% go to Muslim full-time school. Where are the Muslims? are making prayer on the I don't, don't raise your hand. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to get you to raise your hand. How many Muslims are making prayer on a regular basis? How many Muslims fast in the month of Ramadan? You go, you go to the masjids in Ramadan. Don't you find that the masjids in Ramadan are filled? That you don't see during the rest of the year? Where are they? I saw a brother at the masjid in Ramadan. I saw a brother at the I saw a I'll see you next year. <laughs> I had to give the e prayer once. I was in the city. Please don't ask me the city. Don't ask me the city. I was, huh? Don't ask me the city. And I had to give the, the sermon. So, you know, the e prayer, it's like 8 o'clock in the morning. 
8, 8, 15, 8, 30, something like that. So, I said, brothers and sisters, oh, no, I'm sorry, the organizer said, brothers and sisters, Imam Siraj is about to give the Eid prayer. It's very important for those of you who did not pray Fajr prayer this morning, you should pray it now first. Stand up now and pray your Fajr prayer. Now I have my back. And I said, I refuse to look. But temptation got the best of me. <laughs> and I heard all this rustling and moving around. And I looked and behold, 75% of the people were standing up making Fajr prayer. How many of us are making Fajr prayer? Only Allah knows. How many of us really fast in the month of Ramadan? Because nobody knows, because in the presence of everybody, we look like we're fasting. We, like, we look like we're good Muslims. But the reality is, Allah knows really what we do in the public and what we do in private. I give you a quick, quick example from the Quran, which is very beautiful. You, you see, brothers and sisters, one of the worst things that you can be is a hypocrite. See, what do you mean a hypocrite? A hypocrite is a person who shows one thing to the public in private, there's something different. I give an example. Look at this verse from Quran, and give me five minutes, I'll be finishing this up. Can, can I get five minutes? Five? Okay. Five minutes, I promise you, I'll be finished. I'll be finished in five minutes, inshallah. Why are you laughing? I really will be finished in five minutes if you let me talk. وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ آمِنُوا قَالُوا آمَنَّا وَإِذَا خَلَعُوا إِلَى شَيَّاتِنِهِمْ قَالُوا إِنَّا مَعَكُمْ إِنَّمَا نَحْنُ مُسْتَعْزِئُونَ And when they meet those who believe, they say, We believe, but when they are alone with the evil ones, we say, We are really like you. We are really with you. We were only mocking. And you know what? Really, you know what my concern is? My concern is for the youth, and let me tell you why. Let me tell you why my concern is for the youth. You see, brothers and sisters, I decided that I want to become Muslim. I became a Muslim. Nobody in my family Muslim. Nobody. Mother, father, brother, cousin, uncle, nobody. I'm the first one to become Muslim in my family. I became a Muslim because I want to be Muslim. But the danger is, the danger is, that when my children start growing up, where am I taking them? I'm taking them to the masjid. I got their hand, I'm taking them to the masjid. I'm Muslim. I'm taking them to the masjid. But the question is, when did my children decide that they want to be Muslim? And when did you decide that you want to be Muslim? Or are you still living under the shadow of your parents? Are you still acting like a Muslim because you're home and your parents are telling you to dress like that? If you on your own, would you dress like that? If you on your own, would you read the Quran? If you on your own, would you read the Hadith of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, if you on your own? But see, when your children under the shadow of your parents, maybe you act one way at home. I know Muslim sisters who leave the house with their full hijab. And when they get out the house on the way to school, they take off the hijab and put on other clothing. And so, we are really with you. We are only mocking. You got to be careful, especially the youth, because you have to make a decision, I want to be Muslim on my own. You hear me? You, you understand what I'm saying? And now comes the difficulty, in my conclusion. Here comes the difficulty. Live in America. It's rough being a Muslim in America. Muslims watch television. Now, I know, brothers and sisters, none of you watch TV. I know that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a television, wallahi, I've never seen it. There's a television program, I have, nev I, have never, I have never seen it. I've never watched it. It's called Desperate Housewives. <laughs> and it comes on, what day again? Oh, 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 all of a sudden you don't know. <laughs> huh? I believe, I believe, I read, wallahi, I read an uh, article in a magazine, front page, Desperate Housewives, and I read about the program. I know what kind of program it is. I, and I believe there's worse than that. I believe, and you, you'll tell me later what they are. 
I think if you watch, and now I, I'm, I'm, I'm being honest, does Desperate Housewives a half an hour or one hour? One hour. If you watch it one hour, you probably commit at least a thousand sins. I'm serious. You can't, you, you can't watch these programs and not be accumulating sins. You're looking, first of all, brothers, brothers, you're supposed to lower your gaze, man. <laughs> now, I heard that on some of these shows, I said, <laughs> now, I know the brothers do this, and you know what, man, this is research. <laughs> I turn it on, stop for a lot. Stuff them. Look at this. Look at this. You see these devils? Uh, this decadence. Look at this. Stop. Oh, I don't want to be mad. Huh? Huh? Same thing with the computers. Same thing. I'm just going to check it out. I'm not really with that. I know a brother, and sister, you're not going to believe this. Let me tell you something. I hope none of you have a drug problem. I'm serious, I hope none of you have a drug problem. The drug problems are serious. By the way, we had a brother in our community, Abdul Rahman, he was on drugs for 30 years. This man got the, he got the AIDS virus. He's my height, six feet tall, he got down to 60 pounds, we're lying. And the doctor told him, you're gonna die. You're gonna die. He said, leave me to talk to someone who knows. And he said he called to Allah. He was on drugs for 30 years, he called on to Allah. I was 15 years ago. You see him today, a picture of health, we're lying. Looks good and clean. He's our brother who, anyone have a drug problem, we get this brother, Abdul Rahman. This brother is so good, I'm telling you. He can look at you and tell what drugs you're on. <laughs> when you come, everybody come like this. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You say, man, that brother over there, he's on crack. <laughs> that sister, she's smoking reefer. I'm saying, I'm saying, honestly, he, he can do that. He, Allah bless them. He, he, no, I'm sorry. No, he, he, he's been there. He's been there. So, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying to you in my conclusion is this. When you commit sin, it is not to your advantage. And by the way, this is Allah in Quran, and the be Allah bin Mu'minin and Fusim, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon us, closer to the believers than themselves. You have to believe that every commandment that Allah gives you is for your best interest. And whatever he says stay away from is to your detriment if you don't. And shaitan will do the opposite. He will whisper to you to do those things that will bring you down. And the real danger is you young brothers and sisters on these college campuses and young brothers and sisters in this world. It's a, it's a, it's a test, it's a fitna, it's a trial. But I say to you, my conclusion, that you gotta come back, and you come, you, and you can, and you can come back. And let me say that this is critical. There's a case going on in in, um, in New York City right now, and it's a um, it's a um, it's a case in court. It's about an FBI agent who became corrupted. He had infiltrate he had infiltrated the the mafia, and uh, in that he caused, from what we understand the death of five people, given information to the mafia. One of the people in the mafia, they gave him um, immunity to testify. And the district attorney asked him, how many people did you kill? He said, I stopped counting at 50. I stopped counting at 50. There are people, brothers and sisters, who murder every day in this country some 20,000 Americans will be murdered every year. Now, I said that for a reason. I said that for a reason. Every year in this country, people will be murdered one another. The first murder on the planet, Earth, didn't take long. The first son of Adam, murder. There was a man in one of the traditions who murdered 100 people. Let me go back. He murdered 99 people. 
and he wanted to make Tawbah, what I want you to make today, turn back to Allah. And he went and asked the question, who's the, who's the most learned person on the earth? And he said, Rahim, a monk. He went to this monk and said, I murdered 99 people. Can I make Tawbah? He said, no. And he killed the monk. <laughs> a lot of wisdom in that. You know what I'm A lot of wisdom in that. He told him no, and he killed the monk. Then he said, who's the wisest person on the earth? They pointed to a alam, rajulun alam, a, a, a knowledgeable man. He said, I killed a hundred people. Is there a way for me to make Tawbah repentance to God, to come back to God? He says, yes, there is a way. Nothing can stop you from making repentance to your Lord, nothing. And he told him what to do. This man, he said, the place that you live in is a wicked place. Go to this place where people worship God and they don't associate gods with them. Go worship with them. So the man, he went and on his way there he died. And so the angels now are arguing, is he gonna go to hell? Is he gonna go to paradise? So the angels of punishment said he did no good. And the angels of mercy said he intended to do good. So Allah sent an angel and the angel measured the land where he came from and where he was going and he said whichever is closest, the angels can take them. Angels of forgiveness or angels of punishment. One narration said before they, they measured, Allah stretched the land so that he was a little bit closer to where he was going. They measured and Allah forgave him his sin. Hundred of, mur murdered a hundred people. Now I got something for you to think about. New York City, there was a there was a judge, an African American judge, years ago called Turnham Loose Bruce. So, real, real, real case. His name was Judge Bruce Wright. He was very lenient, and he would turn people loose. Would you like a judge, for instance, everybody who comes in front of him to for for him to let them go? Would you like that? Hmm? No one would like that. Why? It's not just. But yet Allah has a way to judge in such a way that if he judges that man, forgives this man, maybe the people that he hurt, they'll get blessings for it. And this, I, get, I have proof from that from tradition. But a Muflis, I, I, have time, I don't have time to go into the details, but the person that you killed may be the one who dies, go to Jannah. I got evidence for that, inshallah. So brothers and sisters, tubu ila Allah, turn back to Allah. You have to go back to Allah. What this taught is what my young, what's the brother read the Quran? My brother read in the Quran this, this afternoon, he began the program with this ayah from Quran, it's very important. Do not despair of the mercy of Allah. I don't care whatever you did, Today, even before you came here, Allah forgives every sin. Does Allah forgive every sin? Almost. Yes, Allah forgives every sin, including shirk, if you do it while you are alive. But what he doesn't forgive if you die in shirk. There's no forgiveness for that. So I'm saying to you, at least before you leave here tonight, there's no God but Allah. And Muhammad is his message. At least that. This is why, before the Prophet's uncle Abu Talib died, he said, Kula ilaha illallah. Say, there's no God but Allah. Say, it's that alone. And then make intention from this night forward, what you're doing, you stop doing it. Brothers, I know you're attracted to the sisters. I know you are. We get married. If any brother want to get married tonight, I'll perform it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I'll do a mass performance right now. Put your guardians on the phone and we hook you up. So brothers and sisters, Allah is, is most merciful. He wants us to come back to him. He wants us to make Tawbah. Do it. It's to your benefit. And remember this before I go. You may say it's a little sin, it's no big deal. But it is a big deal. If you sleep with a woman, brother, that's not your wife, you sleep with a man that's not your husband, you don't know that that day you may get the AIDS virus. 
Maybe one time you did it, or you become pregnant, or you get gonorrhea, and syphilis, and herpes, and all of that. Be patient, and I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, Allah will give you something good. Be patient and wait for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Turn back to Allah. Get back on track. Starting tonight. Who should get on track? Imam Saraj, he's number one. In all of us, we need to get back on track. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and help guide you. I mean, Asami. Now, we have time for some questions. And brothers and sisters, it is now five to eight. Um, anyone have any questions, statements, please don't hesitate. We have another mic out there. Feel free, brothers and sisters. I have time for a couple of questions, inshallah. Anyone would like to ask? Again? Ha! Advice! <laughs> okay. Now, mother says, let me tell you something. My advice to the um, to the criminal uh, justice system. The um, do you have any idea how many Muslims are in the prisons of America? According to all that I've researched, there are at least three hundred thousand Muslims, Muslim inmates, in the prisons of America. Many of them converted in prison. Um, I want to read something to you. I get letters all the time from prison. I thought this was very special. Um, not a, it's going to be a couple of sentences that I think it helps to make my point. Assalamu alaikum. I am writing you from the Station State Prison in Alabama. I would like to inform you that recently I was paroled after 16 years for the conviction of manslaughter. It is my desire and near intention to transfer, transfer my parole to New York City. So until approval, I will remain incarcerated. I told the pro I'm, I'm told that the process takes about four to six months. Allah knows best. Upon arrival, I would like your support with making an Islamic adjustment back into society. I have never seen or been inside any masjid, nor have I seen a Muslim on the streets. I declared, La ilaha illallah, there's no God but Allah, Muhammad the Rasulullah, Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, while incarcerated in 1993 and striving still, alhamdulillah. I do not know my way around New York, so I'm hoping someone would guide me to the masjid upon my arrival. I would like to make salat prayer in the house of Allah on the very day that I arrive. I am told that every year between 30,000 and 40,000 inmates in the prisons of America convert to Islam. 30,000 to 40,000. This is the question. This man, we learn from this hadith, if there's no tawbah, then people become hopeless. If you can't reach back to God, you make a mistake, you can't get back, it's hopeless. And you do hopeless things. If a person served 16 years in prison, I'm asking you this question. Did he pay his debt to society? Did he? Huh? Hmm? But this is the question. If you go to prison for whatever, you serve your term, and they said this is the punishment for your crime, you paid your debt to society. But the problem is when you come out of prison, you never pay your debt because you are stigmatized for the rest of your life. And that person who comes out of prison and they look for a job, the first thing they ask, have you been to prison? Most brothers say no, and they hire them. But one month later, after checking, a background check, they find out that they've been in prison. And then they fire them on the spot. 
If you tell them, have you been, if they ask you, have you been to prison? You say, yes, I'm honest, I've been to prison, but I was released and this was my case. They said, okay, we'll call you. And they will never call them. We have to have ways when these people come out of prison, we have to have some way for them to come back to society like this brother wants to come back. And this is one of my mandates, is to make sure that all across America, when people come out of prison, they have something so they can go back into the main stream of society. I have time for three questions. You don't have to write them down. You can write them if you want, but you don't have to write them down. Three questions. Yes, sir. What are you saying? To, to, but the best way to do what? Stay away from hypocrisy. Stay away from hypocrisy. You see, brother, says, let me let me ask you a question, and I want an honest answer. How many of you think it's possible to believe in Allah and yet not make prayer? If you think it's possible, raise your hand. Okay, raise it's okay. Raise my hand. Raise my hand. Okay. Now, it is interesting. I have never ever read in my Islamic life, and I've studied. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not an alum at all, but I have never ever read any suggestion or hint that it is possible to love Allah and not pray. On the contrary, I read, and you read, where you can actually pray and still not be a believer. Say, the desert Arabs say we believe. Say not that you believe, say that you have accepted faith. You become Muslim, but faith has not yet entered your heart. Do not hypocrites pray? Hypocrites make pilgrimage to Mecca? Of course they do. But the opposite is never true. If you really believe, it's impossible to really believe and not make prayer. You can't do it. You can't do it. Because once you realize that this is what, I mean really, this is what Allah says, I mentioned the hadith earlier, the, the deed most loved by Allah, as salatu ala waqtiha, is prayer on time. If you study, the more you study hadith, you see the significance of prayer, no Muslim is going to not pray. Now I'm not saying that we don't get lazy and miss a prayer here and there, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying if you want to get back, you want to get back on track, you start making your prayer. You want to get back, you start making your prayer your prayer. And one of the ways to get rid of hypocrisy is one of the things, brothers and sisters, you know about yourself. If you know that you go to the masjid and you make prayer, but you don't make prayer at home and nobody's watching you, you need to do it at home when nobody's watching you. That's how you know for sure that you're getting away from the fact or hypocrisy. That's the key because the whole idea of hypocrisy is doing it in front of other people. Because you're not doing it for Allah. You do it for Allah, you don't care who's looking. You do it, you do it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you study, the more you read, the more you're with Muslims, you will see that you will get some of that on you, uh, and you will become stronger in your iman, because one of the great ways to become stronger in your iman, your faith, is to be with people who are strong in their faith. My brother says, I don't mind you, you make me read this stuff. I don't want to read this stuff. I want you to raise your hand. I know this is probably weird, but there are many sisters and brothers who are struggling about marriage issues. What do we tell our parents that we want to get married or the reasons? Oh, when we tell our parents we want to get married, they give us no answer. Like different culture, language, finish school first. We want to do right, but we can't leave the parents. I, I got you. I, I know what you're trying to say. I get your point. <coughs> Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Let me tell you something. One of the greatest struggles that these young men are going to have is struggles with women. Now, we need to talk to the uncles. I, I talk to the uncles and the aunties about that. And it's real because the prophet, peace and blessing, the Apollo said, I didn't leave anything uh, more harmful as a test for the man than the women. And likewise, women for the man because of that electricity, that that bond that I, I talked about. And I'm one who always encouraged people to get married. And the prophet did it, peace and blessing be upon him. He encouraged them to get married uh, at an early age. And there are ways that we can do it. And um, I'll just say this, I, I'm, 
Yes, sir. I know the prophet said peace and blessings be upon him that we should, we should, um, we should uh, fast, and you should fast. We should fast and also get married. And I know, it's, I know, it's, 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 um, it's easy to say. Ah, I like this question. This is very good. Can anyone or does anyone have the right to judge you on your past, even if you had a child before you became practicing Muslim? or been to prison. I'm saying this, brothers and sisters, even if you're a Muslim and you made a mistake, it's okay. Because the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said every human, every, every son and daughter of Adam is a, is a sinner, but the best sinner are those who return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Adam made a mistake. And he learned from his Lord words of inspiration, and he asked Allah's forgiveness, Allah's offer of return to forgiveness. I'm saying, brothers and sisters, listen, you made a mistake, we all make a mistake. We all make mistakes. But I'm saying, don't, it's not the end of the life, it's not the end of the world. And in and, and this country, 30,000 Americans take their lives in suicide every year. People are ashamed, they can't look at themselves. I'm saying, put your head up. Allah blessed you. You know, there was a woman years ago, a black woman. She was raped by a white man. And as a result of the rape, she became pregnant. Could you blame her if she had an abortion? Who would blame this woman? She got raped by a white man. You know what? She had the baby. She decided to have the baby. And she gave birth to a little girl, beautiful girl. That girl grew up to be the mother of Malcolm X. You see, brothers and sisters, sometimes we try to cover up the shame and do something worse. So there are women who have one abortion after another, after other, after other, after other, and the child is innocent, and they're so ashamed of themselves that they want to take their own lives or take the life of their unborn baby, and thus compounding the sin. I'm saying, make tower to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a woman during the time of the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon her. She committed adultery. And she became pregnant. And she came and confessed to the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him. And she, the Prophet, after she had the baby, they had, at that time, capital punishment. Capital punishment is in the law of the Torah. And the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, the same law in Islam, a capital punishment for adultery, and that woman, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, made the funeral prayer for that woman and said that this woman made such a repentance that if it was spread over 70 people of Medina, it would have sufficed all of them. So I'm saying, make tawbah, whatever it is. However bad it is, brothers and sisters, don't, don't kill yourself. You know, if you look in our communities, you'd be shocked who's in our communities. We have brothers, we have imams over masjids who've been to prison. I know them, you don't even know them. And you have no idea what they used to do. But Allah cleaned them up. I talked about this brother, Abdul Rahman, and there are a lot of other brothers whom Allah blessed. Some people write in Islam. One of the greatest examples of Malcolm X and Hajj Malik Shabazz. You read his autobiography. How many read his autobiography of Malcolm? You know what Malcolm used to be. Look how Allah blessed him to clean his life up, and look, he became a shining example. And he goes around, he's not ashamed, he said, yeah, I was in prison. And he talked about his experiences in prison, but Allah cleaned him up. Maybe some of the same brothers and sisters here who make mistakes, and they admit to their mistakes to Allah, and Allah cleaned them up, you just put your head up. You put your head up, and you go straight forward, and ask Allah's forgiveness, inshallah. All right, one more. It's long, brothers and sisters. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to finish. I'm going to finish, because you look like you're tired. Ha! Please mention to donate generously. <laughs> George Mason University, MSA. Now, brothers and sisters, you all look like you don't have a lot of money. Really, you got that look. But please, before you go, there's boxes all over the place. Make a donation, whatever you can. If they want to write a check, what should they write a check to? Huh? 
one of the officers in charge. Make the check to your name. Is that what you're telling me? Write the check to me? Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, so you can't, don't write it to the, to the, to the, to the school itself, but to one of the officers. Wink, wink. I'll see you later, right? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, you know, uh, they're doing a magnificent job. And I, I, you know, I became a Muslim in 1969 at New York University. And I wish there were an MSA then. There was no MSA. And because there was no MSA, I joined what Malcolm joined. I, I joined the Nation of Islam. And if there were some Muslims there, like we have now, inshallah, you never know. Maybe in 1969, instead of joining the Nation of Islam, I would have been a Muslim, inshallah. But now we have MSA in New York University and all over the place. And the brothers and sisters doing a magnificent job here. And um, Brother Farouk, may Allah bless you. This your last year, right? Brother Farouk, um, Yusuf, right? And doing a wonderful job. So please, brothers and sisters, make a donation. And uh, inshallah, um, they will take that money and do some very good and beneficial things. And finally, question. This is a very interesting question. This will be the last one. You had mentioned that um, all the sons of Adam are sinners. A. Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, we know that both Allah, that we know that Allah forgave him and made him free of sin. Now, let me say this. I mentioned the hadith that Aisha said, Why do you do this? Allah has forgiven you past and future sins. Don't ever get confused with the sins of the Prophet, with the sins of human beings. These are very, very small things that we don't even consider sins. It's something very, very, uh, because the Prophet is so sensitive to his obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like Abbas wa ta'ala. A man came and the Prophet frowned. So Allah puts it in the Quran. You know what I'm saying? It's, 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 it's so minute, we don't even consider them sins. And, I was, and, and us, but he's a human being. He's a human being. So the person goes on to say, um, this, is, um, this is very close to the idea of original sin from the Bible. And man is imperfect. Uh, I want to differ with the original sin concept. Allah, the Prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, said, Kulu maludun yuludu al fitra. Every human being is born on the fitra. We don't have the concept in Islam that everyone is born a sinner. Born a, born a sinner. Rather, they born and they commit sin. We don't have the concept of original sin in Islam. And because that goes into the whole point of redemption of, the, of what they say is, is Jesus, peace and blessing be upon him, that he has to come to redeem man because man is original sinner. In Islam, and this is my last point, every, two things we need, brothers and sisters, and please don't ever miss this point. Number one, we need work. We have to fast. We just finished the month of Ramadan fasting. Why did you fast? Why did you fast? Think about what, what the Prophet said. Min soma Ramadan, iman wa tisabin, gufir alhu matakadma min dhabi. Whoever fasts in the month of Ramadan, Allah will forgive them their sins. Every year, everything you do, why are you doing it? Allah will forgive you your sins. Allah will forgive you your sins. So number one, we have to do some work. We have to pray. You cannot not pray. You cannot not fast. You gotta do it. But the other thing the Prophet said, peace and blessing be upon him, very interesting. He said, none of you can go to Jannah by your deeds alone. You need the grace of Allah. He said, Ya Rasulullah, you too? He said, me too. So don't, and, I, and, and, it's, and it's beautiful, you know why? Because you don't get arrogant. Because you know how human beings are? You know, you mess it up every time. Put man in Jannah, he mess it up. No, I'm serious. That's the way we are. That's how you get down. 
That's how human beings get down, you mess it up. So now, you know a person, they do everything right. They make their prayer. You heard about, the, you heard about this young man? He was so pious, he had a reputation of his piety. Man, he'd go to masjid and he'd be in the same spot every time making prayer. He'd be making his prayer. Everybody knew this young man for making his prayer. One day there were some people behind him and they said, behold, this righteous young man always making his prayer. And he's praying, he says, I'm fasting too. <laughs> huh? Huh? Get all arrogant. Now you got, you know, man got a turban to the sky. And that's okay. No, that's okay. You're not wrong. But somehow with the turban and the fowl and the bed and the henna, I mean, let me tell you something. No, no, no. I want you to understand this. Let me tell you something. I, I, I like henna, man. I put some henna on. You know henna, right? I put henna on, shake really. Honestly, when I put henna on, it was too bright for me. It was too red. I don't want to yeah, look like that. I want to do it, so I'm looking for the best one. If you got, if you got some good henna, let me know. I went to a program in Albany, and there was a sister there. I hadn't seen a sister in 15 years. You know, she used to be one of my, you know, students. I said to the sister, I said, Asalaamu Alaikum. I was really excited to, I hadn't seen her again. I said, Asalaamu Alaikum. She said, well, Alaikum Asalaam, where's your henna? <laughs> what? 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 It's not, it's not far. It's like, I didn't make salat. Where's your henna? You make salat? It's not, you see, the, it's, it's so not, if brother wants to wear the henna, it's okay. If you don't want to wear it, it's okay. I'm still a Muslim. So we get to the point now, we see a Muslim, and we look and, you know, we pull out a ruler. Come on, man. Let me measure. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you measuring? What are you measuring? You want to measure someone's iman? You can't do it. You can't measure their iman. So, so what I'm saying is that you can become arrogant even in your righteousness, in self-righteous. So now you, you know, you, you got your head up, you look like a peacock. You know what I'm saying? You like you you all that now. And see, and you, you got to be careful, see, because a lot do this because a person maybe all his life he's righteous, and the right when he right before he get to that door, he start acting like a devil. And then want to go to hellfire. You know what I mean? So don't, even if you're doing good in khair, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessings and keep you on the straight path. Because there's two ways that you can lose your religion. There's two ways. You can lose it from a blowout, or you can lose it from a slow leak. A blowout. A person will begin the day believing, and by the end of the day disbelieve. That's a blowout. How you, how you do that? How you do that? Some trial, some difficulty. It happens to you. And what you gonna do? You lose your job. What you gonna do? You kicked out of school. What you gonna do? You failed the test. So what? So what? You got divorced. So what? You're homeless. So what? Come to Masjid of Taqwa. We got one block from the Masjid, a homeless shelter for men. Come here. We take care of you. We put you in a homeless shelter for a couple weeks and then we'll find a place for you. you. You understand? It's not that bad. Someone said that suicide is a permanent solution for a temporary problem. So you get righteous and you get big headed. Humble. Humble. So you can lose your faith, blow out, or you can lose a slow leak. The last point. The last point. What is a slow leak? Years ago, there was an experiment. And the scientists got a bowl, a, a, a pot of water, and they heated it up. Boiling. And they took a frog and they put the frog in the water. And when they put the frog in the water, the frog jumped out. And then the scientists took another pot of cool water 
and put the frog in the cool water. And then the scientists put a slow flame under the pot until the water slowly heated. And that frog stayed in the water until it died. Why? Because the change is so subtle, so very subtle. You're watching Desperate Housewives week after week. Subtle. Subtle. You're on the computer. And addresses where you ought not be. It don't happen overnight. It's subtle. You read in magazines that you ought not read. It's subtle. It's real subtle. Gotta be careful. Slow leak. Before you know it, you're no longer Muslim. And you didn't know when you lost it. May Allah bless all of you. Come back. I mean, that's all we can do. Allah Khair, Imam Siraj, for coming out and giving this fantastic lecture.